We begin in Havana. He is credited with revolutionizing American literature with his terse, realistic, and often romantic prose. And in many ways, he redefined the meaning of the American dream, globetrotting to exotic locations, absorbing experiences, and writing about them when most Americans didn't even leave home. Ernest Hemingway, the larger-than-life American author and adventurer, was at one point considered the ideal rugged American male. His name conjures up images of bullfighting in Spain, safari in Africa, and cafes in 1920s Paris, where he was part of a young group of writers who became known as a lost generation. What people may not know, however, is that for the last 20 years of his life, Ernest Hemingway lived in Cuba, in a house outside Havana that is not only still standing, but has recently undergone a massive restoration. Senior correspondent Michael Voss and his camera crew were granted special access to Hemingway's home to give America's Now a video tour. He tells us about a preservation partnership between the U.S. and Cuba to maintain the documents of the man still fondly remembered by the Cuban people as Ernesto. Thank you very much for coming out here to the Finca. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. You know, this was Hemingway's really only home. He lived here longer than he lived anywhere else. It's where he had carpenters build furniture. It's where his children loved to come in the summer um, on vacation. And he felt comfortable here. He claims he wrote the best in Cuba than anywhere else in the world. Mary Jo Adams is director of a Boston-based foundation which 10 years ago persuaded former President George W. Bush to make an exception to the U.S. trade embargo in order to help the Cubans preserve the author Ernest Hemingway's legacy on the island. Ernest Hemingway left Cuba in 1960, apparently under pressure from the U.S. Embassy. It was a year after Fidel Castro had come to power, but he must have thought he was coming back because he left everything behind, his books, his paintings, his boat, and all of his papers and manuscripts. But he never did return. A year later, he committed suicide using his favorite shotgun at his home in Idaho. Hemingway's fourth wife, Mary Walsh, was allowed to return to collect some of his documents, but the vast majority of his possessions remained in Cuba. This is just a treasure trove of 3,000 plus photographs, 9,000 plus books. He was a pack rat. Thank you. Gracias a Dios. So there's lots here to conserve, and we hope that by conserving the documents and the home, there'll be a better understanding of Ernest Hemingway psychologically as what sort of a person he was. Ernest Hemingway is considered one of the most influential American authors of the 20th century. He moved to Cuba in 1939 with his third wife, Martha Gellhorn, to finish his book about the Spanish Civil War for whom the bell tolls. He quickly fell in love with the lifestyle here with its vibrant bars and nightclubs and Caribbean waters teeming with game fish. They ended up buying a house on a hill outside of Havana. Finca Vigia, they called it the lookout farm with its distant views of the capital and the sea beyond. When he first arrived here, he was living in a hotel, the Ambos Mundus in central Havana. Martha Gellhorn found the house. Why do you think she wanted to move out to the country? You know, I don't know for certain, but the rumor is that there were less temptations here than there were in downtown Havana. Um, in 1939, this was the countryside. And he wrote here every morning, standing up at his typewriter, and then went back to some temptations or went out on his boat. Hemingway's boat, the Pilar, today sits at the bottom of the garden. Restoring it to its original condition was one of the first joint U.S.-Cuban projects. The work was overseen by Ada Rosa Alfonso, director of the Hemingway Museum at Finca Vigia. El de Pilar se restauró y la colaboración de los expertos norteamericanos eh, complementó la labor de una experta cubana. El barco había sido modificado en restauraciones anteriores, la imagen, 
y en laboratorios de alta tecnología de Estados Unidos, que nos facilitó foto a color de la última etapa. The priority, though, was these thousands of documents, including letters, drafts and manuscripts, which had been stored in damp, moldy basements. For decades, they'd been unseen by Hemingway scholars and risked being lost forever. Now, with American support and materials, 3,000 pages have been cleaned and restored with digital copies sent to the Hemingway collection at the John F. Kennedy Library in Boston. Hemingway never met Kennedy, so why there? The library's director, Tom Putnam, explains. Jacqueline Kennedy was a great admirer of Hemingway and also a believer in Ameri promoting American arts and culture. So she recognized that this would be a wonderful thing. So she reached out to Hemingway's widow and said, we would love for you to donate the materials to the Kennedy Library. We'll have a special room named after Ernest Hemingway. So now we're the home of the Ernest Hemingway collection. What have been the most exciting discoveries so far? Well, there's one letter that I found particularly interesting that was between Hemingway and his editor, Maxwell Perkins. And they were discussing the title of a book. Hemingway is well into the book, and there were many titles that he suggested. I never have any names for anything that I publish until it is time to publish it. Maxwell Perkins said, well, how about For Whom the Bell Tolls? And Hemingway wrote in this letter, that's the stupidest title ever. Who begins with a preposition? Bell, isn't that a, tele, uh, you know, a phone company? Why would we do that? But we know who won in the end. Hemingway was a notorious womanizer with a colorful love life. He soon divorced Martha Gellhorn to marry Mary Walsh, who's most associated with the house. Amongst the collection are a series of letters between Hemingway and a young Italian countess, Adriana Ivancic. La carta de Adriana Ivancic, no publicada, desconocida, de a ver un romance ya considerado platónico. Y bueno, pues son cartas de, de, de un carácter muy íntimo, muy muy cercano, apasionado. The documents may be priceless. But early on in the project, both sides realized that they couldn't return them to a house full of mold and damp. Restoring the property, though, proved a much bigger job than planned. I think the most significant, important work we did was the roof. Mm -hmm. and then we noticed that the beams were full of termites, so really the house was taken down to the studs. How near to the original do you think it is? Oh, I think it's 100% brought back to its state. Um, we had fabulous preservation architects working on the project from Cuba and from the United States. We've taken samples of the stucco, paint samples. It's the original, as close as you can get. It's eerie, it's full of his soul, it's full of his spirit. And Talking about spirits, are those the original <laughs> bottles there? I believe they are. I believe they are because Hemingway left assuming he would come back. And when that didn't happen, this is a house that anyone, when you went on vacation, how you'd leave your home. So those are the original bottles, the original glasses. It's Hemingway. In the dining room, the table is set with the same plates, glasses, and cutlery he used to entertain the constant stream of Hollywood celebrities and other friends and fans who came to visit him in Cuba. Ava Gardner enjoyed Papa's hideaway, as it was known, and reputedly liked to swim naked in the pool, one of the few parts of the property that has yet to be restored. Gary Cooper was another guest. He'd starred in the film version of For Whom the Bell Tolls. It was a story which we now know inspired a young Cuban called Fidel Castro. Cuba's revolutionary leader credits Hemingway's novel for giving him the idea of how to arm the guerrillas trying to overthrow Batista. I must have read it at least three times and I was familiar with the movie, Fidel Castro later wrote. As guerrillas in the Sierra, we always came back to the book for inspiration. And it was Cuba which inspired Hemingway. His passion for fishing, the sea, and the local fishermen he befriended became the basis for his Nobel Literature Prize-winning masterpiece, The Old Man and the Sea. 
He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. This rare footage of Hemingway suggests it was a prize he never expected to win. Today I had no idea that I would win the award, but since I have, I'm very pleased. If I had not won it, I would congratulate whoever won it. Hemingway donated the Nobel Medal to the Cuban people rather than keep it for himself. For Hemingway, the Finca was his oasis. The wild, overgrown gardens were a place to relax and reflect. He said the cool mornings there helped him remember all the places he had been. Like Paris in the 1920s, it's where he met F. Scott Fitzgerald, author of The Great Gatsby, who persuaded the publisher, Max Perkins, into signing the up-and-coming writer, Ernest Hemingway. Cuba is where he wrote A Movable Feast about his young bohemian days in Paris. There are other locations associated with the author around Havana. The next stop on what has become the Hemingway Trail is a fishing village about 15 kilometers away. Papa Hemingway kept his boat the Pilar moored here in the fishing village of Cochima. These days, there aren't many fishermen left, but there are plenty of tourists. But this time, it's not a museum, but a bar and restaurant which draws the crowds. La Terraza de Cojimar is where Hemingway would spend hours before and after fishing trips. On the walls are photographs of him with Fidel Castro. Surprisingly, they only met once at a fishing competition, which Fidel won. He knew many of the local fishermen, amongst them Gregorio Fuentes, believed to be the inspiration for the old man and the sea. There were several other bars in downtown Havana where Hemingway was known to quench his thirst and enjoy his signature cocktail, the daiquiri. Most have cashed in on his connection, none more so than the Floridita. This was Hemingway's principal watering hole, and it's where he'd bring his celebrity guests, like the actor Spencer Tracy. As a tribute to all the money he spent here and all the revenue his memory continues to bring in, they commissioned a life-size bronze statue of the author, which props up one corner of the bar. Today, it's so popular with tourists that it's been turned into an international franchise with Floridita bars in London, Madrid, and elsewhere. More than 50 cans down here in this room. Today, Finca Vigia has become one of the island's major tourist attractions. Tens of thousands of visitors come here each year from all over the globe. Hemingway is as well known in China as he is in the English-speaking world. In order to preserve the house and its contents, tourists can only peer through the doors and windows. In one of the guest bedrooms, his typewriter sits on the small bookcase in homage of Hemingway's habit of writing while standing up. The pages would be scattered on the bed. There are posters from Spain, mementos of his passion for bullfighting, and the walls are also full of stuffed animal heads. When restorers removed plaster from the bathroom, they uncovered the notes Hemingway would write on the wall next to the scales after regularly checking his weight. There are also signs of a superstitious side to the man, with lucky charms like these little pouches filled with stones dotted around the house. Ciertamente era muy supersticioso. Creía mucho en la buena y en la mala suerte. Eh, llevar lucky stone o o chinas peronas en el bolsillo, lo hacía él y lo recomendaba a los amigos. La cola de conejo en el bolsillo, eh, un vigía, un fetiche africano en la parte más alta de la biblioteca. It's surprising because you always think of Hemingway as such a macho man. 
Las personas pueden tener una virilidad absoluta, ser machos, machos, <risa> pero, pues bueno, eso transita por otra filosofía, por una psiquis y puede ser una persona con determinadas supersticiones. Eso no le quita la virilidad ni el machismo a un hombre, me parece a mí. Y para mí, Hemingway es macho, macho. <risa> Hemingway scholars may be finding a gold mine of material in all the newly preserved documents, but for most Hemingway fans, this is the nearest they'll ever get to the spirit of the man. And 50 years after leaving the home that he loved, Ernest Hemingway remains one of Cuba's favorite and most admired adopted sons. Our thanks to Michael Voss in Havana for that report.